Thank you, John. It's a real pleasure to be with John. As I'm sure you all agree, any time you're with John, you have fun. Though today, is, fun is not the proper term, of course. Um, from the last session, which of course is heavy and weighs on us, any of us who have any human heart, I want to switch a bit to much, something much more general, really talking about the culture and then the role of the church within the culture, at least as I see it. I have, uh, for those of you, except for the last section, I have here a copy of the paper on which most of this is drawn. And there, I've got 75 copies of the paper, so there's enough for everyone. So taking notes on that, most of this will be in there, except the last section where I begin to address the issues of what I think the issues of the church uh, that occurred to me after considering what we're about to do. Okay, I've got, uh, I'm going to move fairly fast. Well, if you look over the last number of decades, of course, everybody, no matter who they are, secularist, relativist, anyone, will agree the world has gone through a massive change in sexual mores and that there's quite a crisis out there. Um, now, major changes in the intellectual work of the West about the nature of the sexual act really it's always been there there's always been a heterodoxy in all cultures and even in christian west but where the modern um, heresy secular heresy philosophical heresy really began to take place was probably towards the end of the, the latter part of the 19th century and for the purpose of what i'm going to develop it was really situated cambridge oxford and bohemian london uh, was where the uh, the radical intellectual thought came, which then aggressively pushed forward. Um, it had its effects really 30, 40, 50 years later in Lambeth, and we'll come to that, Lambeth 1930. Now, I don't see the sexual revolution of the United States taking place in the 60s at all, actually. It was the children of the sexual revolution that gave us the so-called sexual revolution of the 60s. The sexual revolution took place in the beds of married Christian couples in the 30s and 40s. Um, however, their children, and we'll get into that a bit later, their children took that sexual revolution outside the home in the 1960s. I'm one of those who grew up with that and contended with that and probably played, well, we won't get into confession here, um, <laughs> but had to deal with it, let's put it that way. Um, very quickly, children who are young adults engaged in the sexual act out of affection and love had children, even though they didn't want them. And those children, of course, were then unwanted, so that when the contraception failed, the children were unwanted. So very quickly in the back of that came abortion. And then the pushes for legalizing abortion, the acceptance of abortion. And of course, that happened then through the 70s. And then by the 80s, what we had was widespread uh, heterosexual sex outside of marriage, and a lot of acceptance of uh, abortion, even though there was a, quite a cultural clash that has never stopped on that issue, but still in the culture at large a huge change had taken place. And by the 80s, the children of those children who'd grown up with this, and now begin to say, well look, if I can have sex, and we can have sex, and we're taught how to have had sex, contracepting for its pleasure, and then not to have children, well you know, Jimmy over here, he doesn't like girls. Actually, he likes Jack. Now, I can jump into bed with Jill. Why can't he jump into bed with Jack? And very logically, they thought that way. And very logically, they accept that. So I want to go back a little because what happened back in the 30s, or prior to the 30s, really has laid the, uh, the seedbed on which all of the rest has grown. And our Supreme Court and the whole culture is going on this very natural um, development that once you sever within the sexual act, conceptually and in practice, once you sever the fruit from the act and want a contraceptive, non-fruitful sexual act, all the rest logically follows. There is no such thing as perversion. You take the child out of the sexual act. The act is just for pleasure. And as we all know, as every husband and wife knows, 
pleasure is totally idiosyncratic. If the purpose of the sexual act is pleasure, anything goes. What anchors the sexual act is its purpose. What anchors it in reality, what anchors it in love, is its purpose. Now, when this change took place, there was quite a change began to take place in men. And this change has already taken place in our culture, has already taken place maybe in some of us. We're all social beings, so none of us are immune to what's around. We swim in the water, we drink the water, as it were. And while if we're prayerful people, go to confession, go to mass, and avail the sacraments, hopefully we're inoculated to quite an extent. But those of our friends who are not, and as you'll see from the data, the vast majority of Americans are not, and a huge change has taken place. There's a, um, I'm gonna take out of a definition by Ismond Rosen, um, uh, Father Harvey, last time I was with Father Harvey was about, oh, 10, 15 years ago, at a conference down in Washington where we had, I, I had the honor of pulling together what I thought were the three top therapists in the world on homosexuality, and Father Harvey was the fourth person there. And in the audience, we had a number of men and women who were either in or had come out of or were struggling with homosexuality as well as a lot of others. I pulled the conference together because I had just switched into public policy and was rather taken aback by the hostility of many of my Baptist friends who were good allies in the fight for the family, but they had an animus against the homosexual person, which as a Catholic I found very disturbing. It was very different than an animus against the sin, it was against the person. So that was really the genesis of the conference and out of it came some great things. One of which was, which struck me very much, that the biggest thing that helps the homosexual man move out of his homosexuality, the biggest thing on the natural level, is the friendship of other men. And that came, it was magnificent to see these three therapists and Father Harvey, none of whom had a slightest bit of animus against any homosexual person had spent their life helping. And the dialogue back and forth and the question and answer over two days after some brilliant papers uh, was magnificent. And clearly what came out of it was, was deep friendship. Of course, it's not sexualized at all. Uh, there's no, none of that. But the deep friendship of men to men who struggle with this is what uh, brings them out. But going back to then, Ismond Rosen, who was uh, a Harley Street psychiatrist, was the uh, editor of the Oxford, what a, imagine having this on your CV, the editor of the Oxford Book of Sexual Deviations. <laughs> Here's something he wrote. Homosexuality is regarded as one of the systems developed by individuals to organize experiences and expressions of conflicting and painful feeling and the system serves as a containment of deeper anxieties and offers for the individual a modus vivendi. The system is not just an object choice. Now, in psychiatric and psychoanalytic terms, object means the one to be loved. Huh? It's not the object choice, but a long-standing way of relating as part of a person's character development and far more, far more complex than the notion of it being part of the object choice, the choice of the other, the homosexual to be loved. It is important to distinguish homosexual identity and homosexual uh, behavior. The presence of homosexuality, but if conflicted or oppressed, could give rise to symptoms such as anxiety, so social inhibitions, or to sexual dysfunctions such as impotence and frigidity. Now I'm going to recast and take that definition and do, you'll see where I'm transposing. Contraception may be regarded as one of the systems developed by individuals to organize experiences and expressions of conflicting feelings and desires. The contraceptive system serves as a containment of deeper anxieties and offers for the individual a modus vivendi. The system is not an object choice, the choice of the one to be loved, but is a long-standing way of relating and is part of a person's character development. It is important to distinguish heterosexual identity and this form of heterosexual behavior. The presence of heterosexuality, if conflicted or repressed, 
as is the case in habitual contraception, could give rise to symptoms such as anxiety, marital inhibitions, or to sexual dysfunction, such as divorce, child rejection, and abortion. You can see where I've transposed. Ismond had said, according to my observation, the homosexual lifestyle is learned, and if this becomes incorporated as part of the individual's sense of identity or self, the chances of that person changing to a heterosexual orientation become much more remote due to the unconscious resistance aroused by the threat of an actual loss of identity or sense of self. I'll transpose that again. The contraceptive lifestyle is learned. It takes a lot of repeated teaching and now has a massive educational and medical infrastructure devoted to attaining that end in our culture. And when it becomes incorporated as part of the individual's sense of sexual identity and habitual practice, the chances of the person changing to a giving sense of self become much more remote due to the anxiety aroused by the threat or fear of a loss of self in the sacrifice involved in bringing a child into existence. Huge parallels. So what I would say, actually, one of the titles I sometimes give to this talk, and the original title I had on the paper, though the editors didn't like it, thought it was a bit too pointed, but what I think actually is happening, what we have, is a homosexualization of heterosexual sex. In psychoanalytic terms, in psychiatric terms, frequently what you would describe homosexuality is an inversion of the sexual into the self, the fear of the other, the going forward. No what you have in contraception is the inversion of the sexuality into the self, the fear of going forward, the fear of giving, the fear of loving. It may have the appearance of engagement, but it has the very opposite. It's actually a form of disengagement, the contraception. There are definite barriers between engagement, chemical, mechanical, or instrumental. Now, there are huge consequences of this, and we can go back, actually, people have always been aware of this. Before this revolution took place in 1930, Theodore Roosevelt, quote from him, birth control is the one sin for which the penalty is national death, race death, a sin for which there's no atonement. Sigmund Freud, in describing some things, describes, I'm not too certain, actually, that he agrees with this, but he definitely describes what's going on. He said, the abandonment of the, of the reproductive function is the common feature of all perversions. We actually describe a sexual activity as perverse if it has given up the aim of reproduction and pursues the attainment of pleasure as an aim independent of it. So as you will see, the breach and turning point in the development of the sexual life lies in becoming subordinate to the purpose of reproduction. The fullness of man lies in becoming subordinate to its purpose. Everything that happens before this turn of events, and equal everything that disregards it and aims solely at obtaining pleasure, is given the uncomplimentary name of perverse, and as such is proscribed. Mahatma Gandhi, by the way, who was lobbied intensively by Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, rejected her stuff. And some of the things he said, artificial methods of contraception are like putting a premium on vice. They make men and women reckless. Nature is relentless and will have full revenge for any such violation of her laws. Moral results can only be produced by moral restraints. All other restraints defeat the very purpose for which they are intended. If artificial birth control methods become the order of the day, nothing but moral degradation can be the result. A society that has already become enervated through a variety of causes will still, be, will still become further enervated by the adoption of artificial birth control methods. As it is, man has sufficiently degraded woman for his lust, and artificial birth control methods, no matter how well-meaning the advocates uh, may be, will still degrade her further. So from being rare early in this century, contraception, or in the last century, rare 100 years ago, contraception has become widespread and habitual. Um, this here is from the National Survey of Family Growth in 1990. I do have 
the one after that, the, the figures essentially haven't changed um, and I hadn't laid it out in graphs, so this one is still pretty much the same. What I have here is parity zero on the far side, that way there, this, the couple has no children. Parity one after the first birth, parity two after the second, parity three after the third conception. At least. You can see couples who have had no children yet, um, the blue and the red, the blue are those who are practicing contraception. The red are those who are practicing contraception because they're at high risk of conceiving. Okay, so the reds are really the critical ones for married couples. After the first child, you see the number goes up. After the second child, it goes up still higher. And it doesn't really change by the third. It does in all, but not for those at risk. And it's getting pretty close to 100%. This here will show what's actually happening to our children in schools over it's from 93 to 2001. The green are the boys who are using condoms in their last sexual intercourse. And the uh, purplish color are the girls. As you can see, it's rising. And for Planned Parenthood and people like that, that's an indication of success, actually. They're getting closer to what they've been working at for a long time. The numbers are going up. Not too much for girls, but still going up. Yet they contend, and from their perspective, correctly, they still have a long way to go because they're in 2001, only 50% of uh, high school student girls were contracepting, or, or no, sorry, the condom was being used at their last intercourse. We we'll get, oh, actually this is sterilizations by the way, which are for married couples the main form of contraception, not the pill and not the, once a couple have arrived at the children they want, what comes in then most frequently now is sterilization, not the use of contraceptives as such. And uh, what I have here is added the husband and wife <coughs> sterilizations together. You can see and this by the way, I. We, I haven't analyzed the National Survey of Family Growth Cycle 6, which is the one that gives us the best data, uh, for whether the first one is going up. I suspect it is. Couples without children, 10% of them are already sterilized, don't want any children. After one child, you can see between the couple, almost 15%. After two children, it jumps up to 46. After three, it was up to 66. I don't know, the numbers may be slightly different on the latest one, I don't know what they are, but it's probably not too far different. We'll get to this a bit later. Some of the outcomes of all of this, well here's the big, one of the biggest. 1950 to the year 2000. For every hundred children born into the United States, what proportion of children experience the rejection between their parents? Divorce, two, two big forms of rejection. The divorce of the parents, they split up. The other form is where the parents have never married and then separate, don't come together actually. The child is born and then they eventually separate. Which actually, even with cohabiting couples, even still, that's still what happens to the vast majority. After five, six years, only about 10, 13% are actually married. 1950, for every 100 kids born that year, 12 kids experienced the separation of their parents, either between the out of wedlock birth or the divorce. By the year 2000, for every 100 born, 60 American kids experienced, experienced the rejection of their parents. There's another way of looking at that data and it essentially comes out the same way. If you look at, at age 18, what proportion of kids are living with mom and dad and you get pretty much the same number. This is the, one of the huge outcomes, I think, of the contraceptive mentality that went underneath. You can see here through the late 60s, mid 60s and that is that huge rise that goes up there in divorce. That's the sexual revolution taking place at the very same time. You know, the mass reproduction and sale of the pill. Divorce went through the roof. A side thing, by the way, uh, and I think it's quite related to this, and there is a difference between men and women on these issues, and the weaker sex on this, not on many things, but on this is weaker. Women divorce 
much, much more frequently than men do, in the order of three to six times greater, 300 to 600 percent higher, when they're working in situations where there are a lot of men, as opposed to men who are working in situations where there are a lot of women. Little known, little data point. I bet you all of those women are contraceptic. I don't have that data, but that's, that's a... Okay, what are the effects of this, this family breakdown? Well, what we get, lower health for newborns and increases in the chances of dying for newborns. Infant mortality, the biggest, single biggest cause of infant mortality right now is out of wedlock births. Medical profession pays little to no attention to that, but the data is there. We get retarded cognitive development, especially verbal development for children early on, if they, if they happen to be quite young when this happens. Lowered educational attainment, lower job attainment, lower income, increased behavior problems, lower impulse control of both anger, the two big impulses that need lots of control are anger and the sexual itself. Uh, decreased social development, increased child abuse and spouse abuse, safest place for women, bar any other family situation is in marriage despite what the feminists say, it's actually the patriarchal family. You get an increased crime at the local community level. By the way, when you control for marriage, there is no difference between the incarceration and violent crime rates between whites and blacks in this country. When you control for marriage, there is no difference between the proportion of white kids and black kids who get into serious trouble. Marriage is the big leveler. By the way, one of the things that has not been developed, I hope somebody sometime does a good piece of research and dissertation on this. The breakdown in the black family, I think, personal hypothesis, is highly related to what Planned Parenthood did to the black family. They were first targeted for contraceptive. It'd be very easy to do that. Well, no, it'd be, it'd be tough work, but it's doable is to figure out just historically where they planted their clinics and then do the demographics, go back to the historical stuff. But I suspect you see it'd be a bit like an infection, the center of an infection and then the, the breakdown of the black family around it. Because the black family preceded, it was always slightly less, the, historically the out of wedlock birth rate was about 13% for blacks when it was 3% for whites. So it was about a 10% difference. But in the late 40s and 50s is when before this happened here across the country, something similar had happened about 10 years earlier in the black family. And I think it's quite related to the contraceptive. Uh, abortions. Uh, this is, well, that's up to 96, that data. And it's been decreasing slightly. The, the interesting thing is actually the proportions between the green and the blue have stayed very constant. 82% of abortions take place outside of marriage. Abortion is the backstop to failed contraception or non-contraceptive. Um, we've indications but not great research that actually after abortion within marriage, marriages tend to break up. Marriages don't tend to survive abortions. Okay, and this is actually if you combine that rejection ratio, how many kids enter into a broken family and combine that with abortion, and this is what's essentially happened to the United States over the last 50 years. We've had the good news of a seeming, de well, definite decrease in surgical abortions. Of course, at the same time that this has been decreasing, we have the rise in the ORU 46 and others, so we, and we've no way of knowing what portion of kids have actually been aborted. But at least in those procured abortions, the news is good. And most of this news, by the way, is coming from teenagers. Teenagers are getting better. There's been a huge investment in abstinence education, and almost from the day it started, back mainly with the Baptists in the South, you saw the decrease in out of wedlock sex uh, among teenagers, decrease in abortion, and increase in postponement of sexual involvement. And what we have here, I, I have the data, let's see, do we have it here? Uh, yeah, this one here. The blue are the teenagers. You can see that going down from about the mid-90s. The red are the, those women aged 25 to 29. It's actually going up, and that has continued still more in the last couple of years. So the out-of-wedlock birth rate 
which has stayed somewhat flat for the last while, actually masks two very divergent trends, one up, one down. Um, now, if we go back, actually, this here, and I did look, this is uh, older data, 95, but the most recent data is almost identical. The proportion of teenagers who, at their first intercourse, depending on their age, are actually contracepting. Now, what you have in red is the rates of, of, of when the first intercourse took place. Under 16, by age 16, that number, that proportion is added. By 17, that's added by 18. By 19, you see it's less and less. Then 20 and over, that's those who remain virgins up to 20 and then afterwards. The blue line with the blue dots at the top are the proportion who are contracepting at their first intercourse, which of course is the main criterion of those who totally disagree with the church on what sexuality is all about. For them, having the first intercourse be contraceptive is, is major success. That's what they're aiming for. Uh, they don't want to have children having babies. and They want them to have condoms so that they're not getting, or at least they've got a decreased probability of STDs. Um, these levels have gone up just a slight tad, about one and a half, two percent overall in the last 10 years. So the slight increase, but not much. Um, but that gives you some idea of how into the culture this contraceptive mentality has come. Now come back to what I, the case I laid out earlier. What this is really doing is inducing a whole inversion of the sexuality into the self. Totally away, right from the beginning, the baby is seen as the enemy or the thing to be avoided. So you've got a deep cultural, cognitive um, transformation taking place. And out, you know, from this, it has given nothing of what they proposed. Abortions went up, not down. STDs have gone up, not down. Out of wedlock births have gone up, not down. And so on and so on. You can name anything that was promised, none of it delivered. So once we've severed the child from the sexual act, we've altered the relationship of marriage to sex. We've altered the relationship of sex to the child, but also once it goes into marriage, we've altered the relationship of marriage to sex. And this naturally led to the altering of sex to marriage. And by the mid-60s, of course, we had what I described, the sexual revolution of the kids having sex. We love each other. Why can't we go into bed? Then we have babies. We don't want them, so you get the abortion. And then 10 years later, everybody's doing it, so why not let Johnny, my gay friend, or my homosexually inclined friend, do so? By the way, I always, I like to keep making a distinction between gay and homosexual or homosexual inclined, because gay is an embrace of a culture of the moral code. There are many homosexual people who are quite saintly and good, and maybe much higher in heaven than any of us will ever get, for as Father Harvey said, the merit of the struggle against something which is more difficult. Huh? So what we have here actually is essentially a defining deviancy down. Daniel Patrick Moynihan, that great, frustrating, Catholic, delightful Irish leprechaun <laughs> who, you know, was the frustration of everybody who loved him, and I was one of those. But um, he had that inimitable phrase, defining deviancy down, which is essentially what's going on here. Now, when the institution of religion, however, begins to define deviancy down, uh, then the other institutions don't have a snowball's chance in hell. And that's almost literal. Hmm? Now, the beginning of this religious severing of the sexual act from the Prodicative was the Lambeth Conference in 1930. And I think most people are, are probably all, everybody in this room is quite familiar with that. However, the history of the birth control movement, if you dig into it, goes much before that. Uh, it has its roots actually outside Christianity in that Bohemian Oxford, Cambridge, the apostles and those of the, they call themselves back then. They targeted, actually, they targeted the Anglican Church because they, they had a sexual revolution. If you read Pepe Cannon, who is, a, is almost a, a flip side of Daniel Patrick Boynan for me, a, a, a lovable, frustrating leprechaun. Um, 
No, he wouldn't like to be called a leprechaun. He's a feisty leprechaun if ever there's one. But he has a, in the Death of the West, he has a brilliant chapter, chapter four, uh, about the, essentially the huge relativist uh, conspiracy. And conspiracy is too broad a word. The, the whole open strategy that we see played out around us, he does it very well. Um, however, back in the late 1800s, these guys, the Bohemians targeted the Anglican Church. They said, forget the Catholic Church. There's no, there's no way that's going to happen. However, with the Anglican, it's possible. And in Lambeth of 1908, 1914, and 1920, there were the proposals to introduce contraception. Finally, it got through in 1930, which was the first severing in Christianity. Up till then, all Christians, there was unanimity. This was a grave moral evil in all situations. The one that got through in 1930 was essentially in those occasions where the health of the mother is at risk. How often have we heard that phrase since? That's what got contraception in, in the Lambeth. Other than that, it was still held by the Anglicans then as greatly uh, a great moral evil. However, very quickly, we had a, a big uh, drop off. I'm going to jump ahead a little here. When I came across doing this, uh, or the research for this paper back about 10 years ago, I then got back in touch with some of the Presbyterians, the Methodists, and all the rest, to try and find a good moral theologian who knew the history of his church. Because they all opposed, even Lambeth actually, the Lambeth Conference drew a huge, massive uh, negative reactions all around. Let me give you the, the Lutherans. This is in uh, 1930. Birth control is properly understood today and involving the use of contraception is one of the most repugnant modern aberrations representing a 20th century renewal of pagan bankruptcy. That was from the leading, uh, the Methodist church. Um, the whole disgusting birth control movement rests on the assumption of man's sameness with the brutes and goes on. This is in 1930 in reaction to Lambeth, the Presbyterian church. The Federal Council of Church's recent pronouncement that they were talking about uh, should, should be enough reason, reason, if there were no other, to withdraw support from that body which declares that it speaks for the Presbyterian and other Protestant churches. The secular press, let me give you a Washington Post editorial of 1931. Washington Post editorial. Give you an idea of how, how the culture has changed, how the culture was on this issue, how it is today. 1931, not too long ago, 75. It is the misfortune of the churches that they are too often misused by visionaries for the promotion of reforms, in quote, in the fields of foreign to religion. The departures from Christian teaching are astounding in many cases, leaving the beholder aghast at the willingness of some churches to teach Christ and him crucified. If the churches are to become organizations for political and scientific propaganda, they should be honest and reject the Bible, scoff at Christ as an obsolete and unscientific teacher, and strike out boldly as champions of politics and science as modern substitutes for the old-time religion. That was the Washington Post, 1931. Editorial. This is not an article. This is their editorial. Okay. The Catholic Church reaction, of course, we had Casti Canubi from Pius XI laying out. Uh, the Southern Baptist had similar stuff. However, Despite all that, jump ahead, 18 years, by 1948, a couple of years after the war, it was universal among, and some people here may know this, or your parents would, among good Protestants who practiced contraception. As a matter of fact, if you weren't practicing contraception, you were getting irresponsible. And it was in tracking back the theologians, I went, how did you go from this in 1930 to this in 1948? That's not terribly long, 18 years ago, my goodness, I'm, that's almost just when I started at Heritage. But, you know, the, the, year, the year's difference, not all that long. And they said, oh, I don't know. The, the answer was the same from all three that I got. Oh, I don't know. We sort of slid into it. A massive revolution they just slid into. Okay, the ontological consequences of contraception. I think they were huge. Looking at this from a human, not theological point of view, but from philosophical. As far as we can know from reason, God's highest creative act is the creation of man. The sexual act, the creator makes man his co-creator. 
both man and God join in the act that is both man's highest naturally creative act and God's greatest creative act, speaking here from natural philosophy. The bringing of another human being into existence for all eternity. In the Orthodox Jewish tradition, the sexual act is compellingly described as of the order of entering the Holy of Holies in the temple, meeting God where he is most especially present. For the resolutely contracepting married couple, however, who goes to worship God on the Sabbath today, an inherent contradiction has crept into his stance or her stance before the Creator as he or she effectively says, I worship you as my Creator, but I refuse to join with you as co-creator in conjointly exercising our highest acts in bringing into being that next human creature you want to endow with existence for all eternity. That is massive rebellion. The contradiction is enormous as the consequences are that the data shows. Psychological consequences? Well, rather than being oriented towards the other, like when, no matter whom, even out of wedlock sex, before contraception, the guy was always very aware, and so was the girl, of what could happen. The third person was always present in potentia. They were both aware, both very aware. So what does that do, actually? Just think about it. Go back to John Paul II's great definition of the human vocation. Man's vocation is the generous gift of self. That's his vocation, that's his calling. This is bad, this is naturally inclined that way, that's his calling. But with the child potentially there, you had this constant reminder of man's vocation. The constant call to the generous gift of self. So what the contraception has done is totally taken that totally away. Totally from man, from woman, from the culture, from the schools, and now sadly, from the churches. Radical changes for society result from being ordered unto the child to being essentially ordered unto the self. I'm doing a big review of European social policy and um, Europeans are much more explicit what they're doing. We're doing it implicitly here. They call it individualization. The whole orientation of social policy is towards the individual to maximize for the adult. And the child is almost totally gone out of considerations of European social policy. In the EU, in England, in France, in Germany, the whole lot. Now, there's a bit of a crisis looming that's going to bring it all back, but we get to that. Now, coming back to this whole thing of the generous gift of self and what the child does. I have a friend down in Washington, good friend of the family, good friend of my wife who's had a lot of children. I won't name her, though so she probably wouldn't mind it, but I go to quote what she said. She had a lot of children. And she said about the third or fourth child, she said, here's a quote. She put the heart of this whole test rather graphically. She said, well, my next child, I had a choice to go insane in trying to preserve some piece of my life for myself or lose myself in yielding it all up for the foreseeable future in the service of my children. That's what children do. And she's become a great woman. She now has a great family and is doing great good in all sorts of other areas that I'm quite sure she never would have come to had she not yielded up. Now, I want to get into the delicate part How am I on time? I'm... Okay. During the 1980s, when I was a young man, still single, in Washington, this was before AIDS hit, I found the struggle for purity was pretty tough. And confession was a necessity in that battle. I often felt, actually, if I had a chance to preach from the pulpit. You know the way sometimes, I'm sure you've all said, now if I, if I was up there, what would I say? Actually, what I realized, there's only one thing I would say. <laughs> Go to confession. You know, I'd develop a great homily on confession. 
Now, by that stage, I was a practicing psychologist. So as a result, I had the confirmation of my own inner human nature in the secrets that others would reveal. I found, you know, when you're in therapy and others are coming to you, they open up. I found, wait now, they're going through the very same struggle that I am. So I'm sure priests get that same confirmation. Therapists, maybe to a lesser extent, but you still get a lot. So I knew the struggles that everyone else was going through in this, and I knew it intimately, and it sort of confirmed my own sense of reality. I often wondered that priests then did not preach it at all, didn't preach confession at all. But I knew they were made of the same clay I was. They had the same struggles. Now this penny took a long time to drop. I resisted, couldn't even begin to intellectually accept. What gradually took, it was after the conference of Father Harvey, this sort of stuff began to penetrate over about a year, year and a half. While we're all somewhat aware that objectively many Catholics who are in the state of sins, where they're before God, they were as, I don't know, but in contracepting and in rebelling against the church, we knew there were many people going to communion when there was nobody going to confession. Like everybody, the, the, you know, everybody leaves the pews to go to communion. There are nobody at confessions on Saturday, year after year after year. Something doesn't compute here. Hmm? And nobody was preaching for confession. And I gradually figured, maybe wrongly, and this is where I say this stuff with trepidation, and I hope you'll pray that it comes across right and it can be used properly. But I gradually figured that many priests were themselves in need of confessing. And then I realized that the holy sacrifice of the Mass had to be offer, offered unworthily by many, which I had no idea, nor do I even want to know. The sheer absence of preaching and practicing and confession and the saturation of the culture and overt sexuality and the fallenness of man made this conclusion gradually inevitable. So what has happened to our sacramental system? Rather than being a channel of grace, it has become a channel of blockage. What? Blockage. There's a metaphor that comes to mind that a good priest gave me a better one. But then he told me afterwards, actually, good priests among themselves use the same one I had come to. Rather than being channels of grace, what happens when the toilet is blocked up? Well, confession is supposed to flush all that stuff away, and it does in the suffering of Christ. But instead, what we're doing in the Mass is something abhorrent, almost too great to articulate. Years later, it gradually dawned on me that the beginning of this awful smoke in the sanctuary that Paul VI talked about seemed to have started with the revolt against the church, teaching of the church and contraception when married people were told to follow your conscience rather than forming their conscience regarding the teaching of the church. Now let's have a look at that. Protestantism was really about private interpretation of the Bible. Hmm? What happened in the church in the 60s was a private interpretation of Catholic teaching. Now this is even more grievous than private interpretation of the Bible, I think. Because what the teaching we're involved in here is the teaching not about the order of revelation and of man, God's relation to man, but teaching about the nature of man at man's, one of his most central acts of all. It's private interpretation of reality. It is the utmost subjectivity, a radical transformation brought into the center of the sacrament of the church, which is to be the great corrective, the salt, to save the rest of society and the rest of reality. Instead, with the private interpretation of follow your conscience, we have here a radical, most radical, subjectivization of that which is objective and real. It is worse than the Protestant revolt. So that 
what we have here is a metaphysical subjectivism that blows all possibilities. Now, as a result, what we have going on out there in the culture, we look outside the church, what are some of the crazy things? We have a killer disease, AIDS, sexually transmitted, killing a whole continent, Africa, and chastity and abstinence are denigrated by everyone involved in those actions. That is sheer, psychotic, certifiable, psychiatric treatment stuff. A denial of reality at a massive level with the World Bank, WHO, <laughs> UNESCO, the whole lot, all involved in it. We have a women's movement that rails against the abuse of women, correctly, but cannot bring itself to admit that the married state is the safest place for women and children. We have an environmental movement that predicted 30 years ago we would all be starving today, but instead we're awash in surplus agricultural products. We have Europe facing a demographic death. I know this data, I've said to European leaders, Europe is already in the coffin, it's only a matter of when we bury it. Do you know for Europe to keep its present European population, European women would have to start having four to five children immediately? That's just a hold steady. You think that's going to happen? Well, God may do it, but the EU definitely isn't going to do it. <laughs> these, are the most, these are some of the most serious denials of reality. And this is what we have. Absolute denials of reality at massive levels in our politics and our institutions all over. Now, this is old, this is old Gnosticism, but it has now come deep into the church. So, to me it's no surprise to find the perversions we were talking about in the last one and the perversions even within the clergy and even in the episcopacy. Because these are those who lead unsophisticated mothers and fathers into a spiritual and sexual inversion. So they actually who do that are more corrupt than those whom they lead. However, married Catholics are not without some level of culpability and I don't know what it is, none of us do. I leave that to the Holy Spirit. But they rebel, they knowingly rebel on contraception. They also dash their heads against the same rock. They're also complicit in building within the walls of the sanctuary the culture that stinks, the dunghill that grows perversions. I can see it in Ireland. Ireland has gone through, you think you've gone through bad stuff here? You want to see Ireland. It is totally, absolutely demoralized. And what our good psychiatrist was saying before, the impact of one abuse is massive. The amount of people who have given up on God, who are not abused, but you see it around. The pedophilia crisis and the homosexual crisis in the church is not just the making of those in the priesthood and the episcopacy, but also of, and from this same, this 95 survey, we know from that that 52% of weekly mass attending Catholics contracept and go to communion at the same time. That's public knowledge. They go to Holy Communion weekly without repentance and also the shepherds refuse to lead them back. These weak shepherds too have built the dunghill. Both are involved. What I'm saying here is very severe. Catholics who contracept are in no place to leave all the blame to the perverse priests who've committed acts. They have provided a lot of the soil in which these perversions grow. The sexual may look the worst, but these crimes are not the greatest. Spiritual crimes are greater still. And the danger we're in here is the sin against the Holy Spirit, the sin against truth. That's what we have here, rebellion against truth. And why is this so great? The reason I think it's so great, look, I'm a sinner. But I have confession to go back to. And I have to know my sins in order to repent. To tell people they are not sinning. 
is to deprive them of calorie. And then all the other consequences that flow from that. What's happening to the sacraments. So, what we need here for this culture, if the salt loses its savor, what is left for it but to be cast out and to be trodden on by men? And what has happened to our church but to be cast out and to be trodden on by men? The Colorado legislation, etc., etc., etc. So the beginnings of the turning back lie, I think, right back here with ordinary men and women, with shepherds who will lead us to follow Christ. On the difficult, very difficult in our modern times, it's not easy, we all need to prop each other up, and we're not saints, and people are not going to stop contracepting overnight, they may not, but they need to go back and confess and confess and confess again. And we need shepherds who will bring them there so that the sacraments will be sacraments and confession will be confession. And God, the Son, will lead us sinners through Calvary and through whose wounds back to heaven. That's the reform that is needed, and it must start with our shepherds. Thanks very much.